We've already heard a little bit from Rabbi Salf and Cantor Kadrain about one of the most iconic scenes that occurs in this week's Torah portion. I think it's actually probably one of the most iconic scenes in the entire book of Breshit, if not in the entire Torah. As Jacob prepares to face his estranged brother, he flees his camp at night, and there he encounters a mysterious man who comes upon him and attacks him, beginning a wrestling match that continues all the way until the morning. This enigmatic scene, most people agree, is the fulcrum upon which Jacob's entire story pivots. Jacob seems himself to recognize this as a turning point because when he finally emerges victorious, he's compelled to rename the very location where the brawling had occurred. As dawn breaks and the sun rises on a new day, Jacob declares that that spot from thenceforward will be referred to as Thunderdome. <laughs> it's not Thunderdome. Nobody should walk away thinking that. He renames it Peniel in Hebrew, which is translated as Face of God. It's not as catchy as Thunderdome, but it's still nice. Now, why does he name it Face of God? He names it Face of God. In his words, he says, I have seen God face to face. Now, you might be thinking, big deal, it's the Torah. Everyone, it seems, gets to see God face to face. But Jacob is actually throwing down a gauntlet by using that phrase. Sure, many figures in the Torah experience God, but almost none of them are described as having an encounter with God face to face. Not Adam and Eve, who hear God's voice, not Abraham, who converses with the Almighty, not Sarah, who is greeted by angels, not Balaam, who encounters God in dreams. None of these biblical heavy hitters are described as seeing God face to face. It is the elite few who receive that designation. And yet Jacob insists that he is among them. So who are the others? You might guess. Moses, yeah, Moses is definitely one of the biblical figures who gets to see God face to face. And that makes sense, right? Moses and God speak constantly. But we are told that no other prophet or person after Moses will ever be able to encounter God face to face the way that Moses did. Now, the other example, because there's only two other examples, it's a little harder to guess. Hmm? You need to be braver for me to hear you. No, it's actually the entire Israelite nation at Sinai. And this also makes sense if we think about it, because we're told that that revelation at Sinai was one where God spoke directly to all of the people, all at once, without any intermediary. And once again, our tradition tells us that it was an unparalleled event, that that type of revelation ends at Sinai and will never occur again. We might be able to glimpse it through studying Torah, but there's not going to be a second Sinai when God speaks directly to all of the people. Now, these other two examples of what counts is a face-to-face -face encounter kind of further complement, com not complement, but complicate Jacob's situation because where is God in this encounter he has? It's only nine verses of Torah, and in all of those verses, God does not speak, and God does not appear. Sure, many people read this mysterious figure with whom he wrestles as an angel, but that hardly counts as a face-to-face -face encounter. So there must be something else going on underneath the surface of the text that would explain why Jacob is able to explain that he sees God face-to-face. -face. So let's see what happens. As we heard, Jacob was never the same again. I think were your words, Rabbi Saul. And this is unquestioningly true. He is changed by this wrestling match. He enters haunted by his past, which is finally caught up with him. A past that is full of lies and deceit. These things reveal him to be someone who is deeply uncomfortable with himself. And this discomfort manifested almost immediately, right at birth, so much so that Jacob is named, Jacob in Hebrew means heel grabber for he was always chasing after his brother. And he spent his formative years, in fact, grasping after what others had. 
unable to see in himself anything of worth or of value. Jacob always wished to be other than he was. He pined for the physique and talents, for the blessing and birthright of his older brother. He craved for the love of his father that was withheld. He wanted the wealth and the herds of his uncle. And all of this pining and longing and yearning led Jacob to the basest of acts, trickery, falsehood, duplicity, and fraud. And it also blinded him to any of his own gifts, and it blinded him to his own calling. For in all this time so far, Jacob has done almost nothing to advance the covenantal promise. Instead, he pines after the benchmarks of success that aren't defined by who he is. But Jacob leaves the wrestling match completely transformed. He's different. It's as though he finally has accepted who he is and who he is called to become. Jacob walks away ready to take on the covenantal blessings for which he was born, ready to return the blessings that he stole from his brother and to try to repair the relationships that he's damaged. So changed is he that, in fact, he's able to put all of this into practice the very next day. It's as if, having finally made peace with himself, he can now make peace with his brother. Finally, he sees in himself the gifts and talents necessary to be renamed Israel, to be a patriarch who can embody a people, an entire people, and its purpose. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs puts it this way. In the past, he said, Jacob struggled to be Esau. In the future, he will struggle to be himself. These scenes conclude with the phrase, Vayavoya Akov Shalem, which we can translate to mean Jacob emerged complete or whole. Through this encounter, he realized that he didn't need to look like, act like, or grasp after others. Instead, he had to struggle to discern who he was, what he was called to do. And when we do that, it seems it's like seeing God face to face. And that's important because it means that face to face encounters with God maybe are still possible. Torah tells us we're not going to be like Moses. And God is not going to speak to us today like God did at Sinai. But Jacob's experience at Peniel is open to all of us when we have the strength to see in ourselves our true identity, to recognize that it's worthy and enough, and to comprehend our task and our purpose. It's as if we see God's face. And sure, along the way, each of us will encounter Esau's, those images towards which we try to conform because we think our lives will be better or more fulfilled if only we could be more like them. And we may, like Jacob, try in vain to live someone else's life or to wear someone else's face, but in time it will hollow us out and bring us down low. Judaism's conviction is that each of us are made and fashioned exactly as God intended. And until we find the strength to recognize our gifts and their accompanying responsibilities, and we're not truly living. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel taught that each human being, every single one of us, must be ready to say, there is a task that only I and I alone can carry out, a task so great that its fulfillment may epitomize the meaning of all humanity. And the story teaches us that when we discover that task and we begin to walk a road towards its fulfillment, we encounter God face to face because we finally see God's purpose within ourselves.